So with lecture six, we're halfway through our module. And remember, we said earlier that as you approach the middle of the module, it becomes more and more difficult. So this lecture and maybe next lecture will probably be those with the most content. I won't say that the most difficult, because it isn't difficult, but the most content. And then it'll gradually become easier as we start doing the digital work. When we do sampling, that's already familiar to you, sampling and quantization. So today is our final lecture looking at amplitude modulation. We'll be looking at the demodulation of what we introduced last week. So here we are, we're talking about DSB demodulation. That's the end of our amplitude modulation streak. We have a class test on the 10th of March. Remember I said put that in your diaries because it isn't a normal lecture slot. It should be in your timetable, but even if it isn't, make a note of it. One o'clock, Tuesday, the 10th of March. Following that, we'll do, well, not necessarily following that. We'll probably start angle modulation before the class test. But our class test is on the 10th of March. So remember last time, what seems like ages ago, the week before last, we spoke about a different kind of amplitude modulation. An amplitude modulation where either the carrier is absent, and that's DSB-SC, where the carrier is suppressed, or where one of the sidebands is absent, single sideband, or where the carrier is present and one sideband is present in full and one sideband is partially present, vestigial sideband. So we, we, we introduced those three variants of amplitude modulation. We spoke about them in the frequency domain, perhaps more than in the time domain. So if you just follow this briefly, this is your baseband signal. That's what happens when you have full AM with two sidebands and a carrier. When the carrier is absent, we call that DSB-SC, suppressed carrier. If you have only one of the two carriers, that's single sideband. And then vestigial sideband is where you have one of the sidebands and part of the other. Importantly, we introduced something called, we introduced the modulator, the modulator for DSB-SC. And it's exactly the same as the modulator for AM, except we don't add a carrier term. What does that mean? Does that mean there's no carrier? No, it means we don't clamp our signal. We don't add DC. There's no vertical shift. We don't raise the signal before multiplication. So it's the simplest modulator in the world. It's simply a multiplier. In practice, it isn't that simple. The actual circuit isn't that simple. There's something called a balanced modulator or a Gilbert modulator. And there's, there's in terms of block diagram and electronics, it's more involved than that, but I've kept it simple for this module. Mathematically, it's just a multiplication process. You have your message, M of T, you have your carrier, cosine omega CT. You multiply the two and you have that. That's what it looks like in the time domain. The spectrum will look something like that. Okay, so that was last time. Today we're going to look at the opposite. We're going to look at demodulation. So, the demodulating block diagram will look a little bit like that, but it's different. Okay? Now, even if this diagram doesn't look like it's got blocks, we call that a block diagram. I'm mentioning that because almost every year I say in the final exam, draw the block diagram of a DSB modulator. And people struggle with it. Perhaps because they don't realize that that's a block diagram, even if there are no blocks. Okay, so, um, so the actual question, and, uh, and I'll, I'll share all these at the end of the semester, and we'll go through some solutions. The actual question is, draw a block diagram 
of a DSP suppressed carrier modulator and demodulator. So that's two block diagrams. Sketching the signal in the time and frequency domains at the output of each block. Okay, so it's what you see in front of you. You have your signal, that's time domain. You need a frequency domain plot of that. You have your carrier, that's a time domain. You need a frequency domain plot of that. You have your product here, that's a time domain, and that's a frequency domain. Now, if your, if your input is just a simple cosine or a sine, then the spectrum will not be continuous. It'll be discrete, just two, two impulses on either side of the carrier frequency, not the carrier component. Okay, so that, that question is typically worth 10 marks, not five marks, because it's two block diagrams and it's six signals in the time domain and six signals in the frequency domain. So 12, spec 12 signals, two block diagrams. Easy question, 10 marks. Remember this from last week? So we summarized, we said there's trade-offs. Some have higher bandwidth than others. So AM and DSB, obviously, because of the double side band, we have twice the bandwidth for the same information. So FM is your message bandwidth. Your band pass bandwidth is twice that. For SSB, it's exactly that. For VSB, it's somewhere between one and two. We spoke about some of the applications of these. Today, we're going to talk about demodulation. We're going to introduce something called a synchronous or a coherent demodulator. So wherever you hear the word synchronous, or more commonly, perhaps, the word coherent. When you see that, that's referring to the kind of demodulator we're going to describe today, where at the receiver, you have a local oscillator or a phase lock loop. You have some way of either generating a carrier or a carrier term, a signal that's the same frequency and phase as the carrier, or we capture the carrier from the original signal and use that to, to tune our local carrier. So we're going to talk about what happens if the local oscillator contains an error, if there's some error in the frequency or phase of our local oscillator. Next week, there's a problem class on Monday. And then Thursday, we're going to launch our second set of amplitude modula analog modulation lectures. We'll talk about analog, uh, angle modulation. It's confusing, isn't it? Amplitude modulation is what we're finishing today. Angle modulation is what we're going to start next week. Angle modulation includes frequency modulation, FM, and phase modulation, PM. Okay, so they both start with the letter A, some confusion. Some books call it exponential modulation, EM. But basically, it's FM and PM we'll be looking at, okay? We've already spoken about the class test. This is DSB, nothing new. So DSB, that's what we're trying to demodulate today. DSB is a message multiplied by a carrier. No DC term here. So no carrier term here. So that's my message. That's my DSB signal, band pass signal. Base band, band pass. Bandwidth of FM, bandwidth of 2FM. Nothing new. Today we're going to look at how to recover the original message. When we were looking at AM with a carrier, We looked at this in the time domain, didn't we? We said we need something that will trace the envelope. We said we need a rectifier, a capacitor, and a diode to trace the envelope. And we spoke about time constants. So everything was in the time domain. Today, we're going to look at it a little bit less in the time domain because we're not looking at the shape of the signal. We'll look at it in the frequency domain, and we'll look at it mathematically. Okay, so when we were looking at AM, we weren't interested in the maths. 
Today, we're interested in the maths, simply because it's less confusing that way. Nothing new. That's just a fancy way of presenting that. Okay? Nothing new. So this is from last lecture. We have our signal, baseband. Let's say it's a simple cosine, okay? just for mathematical simplicity. It has some amplitude, AM. We have our carrier with some amplitude, AC. Frequency, omega C. Omega C, much bigger than omega M. <coughs> we multiply the two, we get this. Ah, this is still AM, so there's a, there's a, a little DC shift in here. Okay, so recovering this, we would have used the envelope detector. The point is the envelope detector won't work for DSB. So once our modulation index reaches 100%, if we go beyond 100%, we can't use an envelope detector. Okay, so we, we've already established that, I think, very clearly. And in our last lecture, I presented a little YouTube clip where I showed you what would happen or how the frequency would change if we were to overmodulate. Now, look at this. Same thing, this time we have DSB. We multiply, we have this distorted envelope that's no good for us. In the frequency domain, we'll have these two sidebands. The question is, how do we recover the message without tracing the envelope? And I said, we're going to look at it mathematically. So bear with me. There's four or five slides. Very, very simple maths, OK? Really basic stuff. Bear with me. By the end of this, we will have finished amplitude modulation. So S of t, that's our baseband signal. That's what we're about to transmit. M of t is my message, which for this example is just a simple cosine. The carrier in blue. So I've got the message in green, carrier in blue. When I multiply them, I have a product of two cosines. What's cosine times cosine? So cosine A, cosine B will give you half cosine A plus B plus half cosine A minus B. So you'll have these two components, the sum component and the difference component. Is that new to you? No. That's the frequency shift property of the Fourier transform, also known as the modulation property. And that's why modulation works. That's why multiplying by a cosine causes that shift in frequency. That's why modulation works. So this isn't new to you. But I want you to look at what we're trying to do now. We want to recover the original message. Where is my message now? It was in green, but now it's lost. Where is it? That bit is message there. Maybe I'll color that in green for you. And that bit there, omega m, that's your message. And again, you have your message here. And you have your message here. So you've got your message mixed up with your carrier signal. How are you then going to extract it again? How are we going to recover omega m from here? Actually, it's really easy. If you look at that block diagram, it looks like nothing's changed. It looks like the exact same block diagram. Look carefully, spot the difference. Modulation, demodulation. Modulation, demodulation. Same block diagram. No difference. I've added a low-pass filter, but it's the same block diagram. So demodulation is the same as modulation in the sense that I'm still multiplying by a cosine of the same frequency as the carrier. So it's as if I'm modulating it again. So I've already shifted the frequency up. Now I'm going to shift it again. But because it works both ways, I shift up and down, it also works as a demodulation. So S of t 
What's S of T? S of T was that expression there that we were struggling with. S of T is that baseband signal. I'm going to take that S of T and multiply it by a carrier. Where's this happening? Where's this happening? This is happening at the receiver. This is happening. So when I, when I try to unlock my car, it's happening in my car, not at the transmitter. So we're talking about DSP here, yeah? So we're talking about the kind of communication you'd have with your, with your garage door or with your, with your car door. So this is happening at the receiver. What's happening? S of T, which I'm transmitting from my key fob, is being multiplied by some high frequency signal, omega CT, cosine omega CT. And what's happening? So S of T, that's the blue signal we just spoke about. It's the message times the carrier. Don't worry about A. Why have I swallowed up AM and AC? If you go back, there was an AM and there was an AC. Why have I swallowed those up? Where have they disappeared to? Why don't I just include those? So there's an AM and an AC, the amplitude of the signal, amplitude of the carrier. Why have, I dis why have I ignored those and stuck in just another constant, A? What's the relationship between A and AM, AC? What's the relationship between that A and the A on the previous slide? There's no relationship, really, because AM, AC... That's what was generated inside the modulator. That was then amplified by a radio frequency amplifier and transmitted. And then it's traveled until it's reached the receiver inside my car. But as it traveled, it was distorted. There was interference. There was noise. There was attenuation. Amplitude reduced. So that by the time it arrived at the car, the amplitude was much, much smaller than it was when it was transmitted. So I've just called that new amplitude A. Okay? So the new amplitude has no relationship to AM and AC because they were amplified anyway before transmission. We didn't speak about that bit. We spoke about this modulation process. But before transmission, there has to be an amplification process. We didn't speak about that. So I don't want you to think that that is actually AMAC. It isn't. It's just some amplitude A. So that's my message. That's my carrier. That's my local carrier. Why do I call it local? Because I've generated it at the receiver. OK, so if I have one transmitter and 100 receivers, then there's 100 local oscillators, each, excuse me, each generating cosine omega CT. What happens when you multiply two cosines? You either say, well, you have the cosine of the sum, cosine of the difference, or you can say, well, the difference is 0, cosine 0 is 1, and the cosine of the sum, cosine omega ct plus omega ct is 2 omega ct, or you can just use the identity. So the cosine cosine gives you that, which gives you that, and then if you multiply that by your message, you might not be happy about that. You might say, wait, cosine omega m was multiplied at the transmitter. Why are you multiplying the two cosines first and then multiplying by cosine omega m? I can do what I want. It's mathematics. Okay? In real life, yes, of course, it's multiplied, transmitted, and then it's multiplied by the carrier. But mathematically, we can do that. Mathematically, we're allowed to do that. So, you end up with that. You have cosine of the sum, cosine of the difference. So you've got 2, two omega ct plus omega m, 2 omega c minus omega m. How many terms? Three terms. Where are we looking? We're looking right here, before the low-pass filter. Which of these three terms contains the carrier? The answer is, all three contain the carrier. No, sorry. My question should have been, which of these three terms contains the message? All three terms, all three terms contain the message. 
But which three terms is the message? The first term, it is the message. Is it exactly the message? Probably not. Because we've lost AM and we have A, and there's probably some noise that's been added, but this is the closest version to my message that I'll get. This is a shifted version of the message. This is the upper sideband, and that's a shifted version, lower sideband. But wait, why am I calling it sideband? This is at the receiver after demodulation. So these are images of the carrier shifted up, sorry, of the message shifted up, not by FC, but by 2FC. You see? That is your message, but it's shifted up by two times the carrier, and this is shifted, again, two times the carrier. But this is what we're trying to recover. How do I recover something with a low frequency from signal that has three components, two of which are at a high frequency? How can I recover the low frequency? What do I use? What do I use to recover a low frequency signal from a signal containing low and high frequencies? I use a filter. What kind of filter? The kind of filter that will allow low frequencies to pass and will block high frequencies. So it's called a low pass filter. So my low pass filter will block these two terms, will allow this term to pass. That will be my demodulated DSB. So th this was all before the filter. After the filter, these higher frequency terms will be removed. They'll be blocked. They won't be allowed to pass. They'll be attenuated. They'll be multiplied by zero. And all we'll have left is a version of the original message. Why is it scaled down? Well, it was scaled down by my low-pass filter, number one. It was scaled down by transmission effects, by distortion, number two. What we haven't looked at is noise. There will be noise. There might be interference. But we're interested now in how we're recovering the signal. So, what's our coherent demodulator? It's simply multiplication followed by a low-pass filter. Multiplication followed by a low-pass filter. What's the cutoff frequency of the low-pass filter? What kind of frequency should I be blocking here? It's for the time constant. Remember how we set the time constant? We said the time constant is greater than FM less than FC. Or I should say the time constant is greater than 1 over FC less than 1 over FM. So how do we set the low-pass filter cutoff frequency? What should the frequency be? Should it be less than or greater than FM? It should be greater than FM. A little bit greater than FM or much greater than FM? Well, your low-pass filter should have a cutoff frequency of FM. Because if it's greater than FM, you'll be allowing frequencies higher than the frequency of the message. What kind of signals have a frequency higher than the frequency of the message? By definition, it's not your message, right? So what exists out there on the radio channel that has a frequency greater than the message? It's either noise or interference. It's nothing else. If my message is 5 kilohertz and I set a low-pass filter frequency of 12 kilohertz, then I'm allowing 7 kilohertz of rubbish. What am I listening to? I'm listening to 7 kilohertz of noise, 7 kilohertz of interference. So I want my low-pass filter to be as close as possible to the cutoff frequency. In practice, it, it has to be a little bit over because you never have an ideal frequency, an ideal low-pass filter. Your low-pass filter will have a gradual roll-off, and you don't want to lose that 5 kilohertz. You don't want to lose the frequency component of FM. So you might have a slightly 
larger cutoff frequency. So that's why we call it a coherent or a synchronous detector. Because you have a local oscillator at the receiver that's tuned to the carrier frequency. How does that happen? How is the local oscillator, how does it know what the carrier frequency was? How does my receiver know what the carrier frequency was? Well, it depends what kind of device we have. If it's a radio, you tune it. You tell it what frequency you want. If it's something like a, a garage key opener, it's already fixed to a particular frequency. It can't be changed. So we use some things, something called a phase-locked loop to try to identify and lock onto the frequency and phase of the carrier. But sometimes there are errors, there are imperfections. Sometimes the signal, the local oscillator that we generate, isn't exactly at the right frequency. And that affects the quality of our signal. How does that happen? That's the content of the next few slides, which I'll cover in the last few minutes. We have two types of error. The error can be in the frequency, right? So if I have 100 kilohertz, what if I have 100.02 kilohertz at my receiver? So my, my FC will be off by some small amount, delta omega, OK? I could say delta F, but I'm using delta omega just because of the mathematics. It might be the correct frequency, but incorrect phase, delta phi. So it might be correct frequency, just shifted a little bit. It might be a sine instead of a cosine. It might be shifted by a few, a few degrees. And it might be a combination of the two. You might have a frequency error and a phase error. How will this affect the quality of my received signal? So we've already said the received signal will be scaled down. We already said it might be affected by attenuation, noise on the channel. We said it might be affected by the bandwidth of the low pass filter. So those three things are happening. But as if that wasn't enough to make it even worse, there could be an error in the frequency or phase of the local oscillator. How will that affect our signal? Follow the maths. It's not much. Just be patient. So I'm going to do exactly the same maths. I'm going to multiply two cosines. By multiplying two cosines, I have a cosine of the sum, cosine of the difference. No difference to the previous slide, except this time, instead of having omega c, we have omega c and delta omega. So when you multiply these, we have the sum term, where omega c plus omega c is 2 omega c. And that just adds on delta omega. And you still have that there. So you have the frequency term. So that was the sum. That was the difference. After the low-pass filter, the high-frequency components are filtered away, chopped off, cut off, attenuated, multiplied by 0. What you're left with is your message. How is that different from my original message? Well, it's multiplied by this thing here, cosine delta omega t plus delta phi. Now, ideally, delta phi would be 0, delta omega would be 0, and we're multiplying by cosine 0, which is 1, ideally. In practice, if it isn't ideal, we can have Delta omega, delta phi, or both. They each affect the quality of the signal. Now, let's assume our signal is an audio. How does that message sound? How does cosine omega m sound? It just sounds like a pure sine wave, just a, a continuous tone, a continuous beep. That's what we're listening to. How will it be affected if it's multiplied by another cosine? Well, multiplying by cosine, let's look at 
the phase error first. If, let's say there's no frequency error, delta omega is zero. All we have is delta phi. So cosine delta phi is a constant, right? If delta phi is zero, cosine zero is one. If delta phi is 45 degrees, cosine 45 is root two over two, 0.707. So my message will be multiplied by 0.7. How will that affect my message? How will it affect my received signal? If it was a radio signal I'm trying to listen to it, how would it affect my received signal? Multiplying by 0 0.7, how would it affect the quality of a single tone? It would simply attenuate it, scale it down, reduce the volume, softer, lower amplitude, okay? How do we overcome that? You amplify it. Put the volume up. Come closer, okay? So not, not a big problem. Unless, unless what? Unless... unless we have a 90 degree phase error, pi over 2. What's, a, what's special about pi over 2? Anything special? Nothing special about pi over 2, 90 degrees, except cosine 90 is 0. So my signal will be so soft, it'll have an amplitude of 0. So if I amplify it, I turn up the volume, if I come closer, all I'll hear is pshh. You'll hear the noise. You won't hear the signal because it's gone. It's been multiplied by cosine pi over 2. Okay? So, is phase error a big deal? Is it a problem? No, unless you're 90 degrees out of phase, in which case nothing you can do to recover your signal. Now, if we don't have a phase error, we have a frequency error, this time we're multiplying by cosine delta omega multiplied by t. This time, my signal is multiplied by something which is not constant. It's not multiplied by 1 or 0.7. It's multiplied by something that's going up and down, up and down, up and down, something that's increasing and decreasing. How fast is it changing? It's changing at delta omega. So it's if delta omega was 2 pi, then it's changing once every second. It's going loud, quiet, loud, once a second. If you have a continuous tone, beep, and it's multiplied by 1, 0, 1, 0, once every second, how does that sound? Imagine how it would sound. So every second, every second, your tone, your continuous tone, is cutting out. And then it's coming back. And then it's getting louder and louder, and then softer and softer, and then cutting out. Once every second. That's for one hertz. Two hertz, twice a second. How many zero crossings are there in one cycle of a sine wave? How many zero crossings? Two. So if, if my error is one hertz, then delta omega will be two pi radians per second. How many times will my signal cut out per second? Twice, right? So my continuous tone will be affected by what we call a beating. So sometimes if you listen to AM radio late at night and you're listening to a faraway channel, you can just about hear what they're saying, but because it's affected by this beating, the signal's getting louder and 
it's softer, louder and softer, louder and softer. So it's, it's like it's pulsing. And that's because there's a phase, there's a frequency error in the local oscillator. And if you have both a frequency and a phase uh, error, then it'll be attenuated and it'll be affected by this beating. This beating is a form of distortion. Okay? That was a coherent demodulator. So we covered coherent demodulators and errors that can happen with coherent de demodulators. Where do we use them? We use them with DSB suppressed carriers. The question here is, can I use a coherent detector with AM? So last time, before, well, three weeks ago, we were talking about AM, where we have a carrier, where we use an envelope detector. Can I use what we spoke about today to receive AM. So in AM, we look at the envelope. In DSB, we multiply by a local oscillator. Can I do the same with AM? That's the question. Is it not working? So, an envelope detector is for use with AM only. A coherent detector, or a synchronous detector, where there's a local oscillator, is for use with DSB, suppressed carrier. <coughs> My question is, can I also <coughs> use that for AM? Can I also use that for AM? That's a question I'll leave for homework for you to think about, okay? It's not simple yes-no answer. You need to actually do the maths and see is it possible or not. It was an exam question, okay? Now, when, when, when I set this first as an exam question, I hadn't raised it in class, okay? So it was a surprise exam question, okay? So if you see it, it'll be a boring exam question because you've already seen it and you know the answer. Well, you don't know it yet, but I've given it to you for homework, so you should know it. When we meet for our problem class, I'll go through it with you, okay? And I'll record a video about it. So if you were to see it in an exam, it will be a boring exam question, not a surprise. What does that mean? What does that mean for your exam? There'll be a different question that you haven't seen, okay? But I'm telling you this so that you can be prepared. There will always be a question which is sort of, sort of surprising. But I try to give you as many hints as possible as to the kind of thing you should prepare yourself for. Okay, so that was our last slide. Um, see you all on Monday for our problem class, and then Thursday we start talking about FM.